to hunger. Mirza Nuruddin Big Muhammad Khan Salim, known by his imperial name, Jahangir, August 31, 1569, October 28, 1627, was the fourth Mughal emperor who ruled from 1605 until his death in 1627. His imperial name, in Persian, means conqueror of the world, world conqueror or world Caesar Jahan, world, gir, the root of the Persian verb jerftan, to seize, to grab. The tale of his relationship with the Mughal courtesan, Anarkali, has been widely adapted into the literature, art and cinema of India. Prince Salim, later Jahangir, was born on August 31, 1569, in Fatehpur Sikri, to Akbar and Maryam as Samani. Akbar's previous children had died in infancy and he had sought the help of holy man to produce a son. Salim was named for one such man, Sheikh Salim, though Akbar always called him Sheikh Hubaba. Prince Salim forcefully succeeded to the throne on Thursday, November 3, 1605, eight days after his father's death emerging victorious in the vicious struggle for succession between the five prominent and legitimate sons. Salim ascended to the throne with the title of Nuruddin Muhammad Jahangir Badshaghazi and thus began his 22-year reign at the age of 36. Jahangir soon after had to fend off his own son, Prince Khusrau Mirza, when the latter attempted to claim the throne based on Akbar's will to become his next heirs. Khusrau Mirza was defeated in 1606 and confined in the fort of Agra. As punishment Khusrau Mirza was handed over to his younger brother and was partially blinded and killed. Jahangir considered his third son Prince Guram, future Shah Jahan, his favorite. In 1622, Kuram murdered his blinded elder brother Khusrau Mirza in order to smooth his own path to the throne. In 1622, Jahangir sent his son Prince Kuram against the combined forces of Ahmadnagar, Bijapur, and Golconda. After his victory Kuram turned against his father on make a bid for power. As with the insurrection of his eldest son Khusrau Mirza, Jahangir was able to defeat the challenge from within his family and retain power. In 1623, the Mughal emperor Jahangir, sent his Tahildar, Khan Alam, to Safavid Persia, accompanied by 800 sepoys, scribes and scholars along with 10 howdahs well decorated in gold and silver, in order to negotiate peace with Abbas I of Persia after a brief conflict in the region around Kandahar. Khan Alam soon returned with valuable gifts and groups of Mir Shikar, hunt masters, from both Safavid Persia and even the Khanates of Central Asia. In 1626, Jahangir began to contemplate an alliance between the Ottomans, Mughals and Uzbeks against the Safavids, who had defeated the Mughals at Kandahar. He even wrote a letter to the Ottoman Sultan Mir at four. Jahangir's ambition did not materialize, however, due to his death in 1627. Salim was made a mansabdar of 10,000, Das Hazari the highest military rank of the empire, after the emperor. He independently commanded a regiment in the Kabul campaign of 1581, when he was barely 12. His mansab was raised to 12,000, in 1585, at the time of his betrothal to his cousin Rajkumari Manbay, daughter of Bhagwant Das of Amr. Bhagwant Das, was the son of Rajabar Mal and the brother of Akbar's Hindu wife and Salim's mother, Maryam as Samani. The marriage with Man Bay took place on February 13, 1585. Jahangir named her Shah Begum, and gave birth to Khusrau Mirza. Thereafter, Salim married, in quick succession, a number of accomplished girls from the aristocratic Mughal and Rajput families. One of his early favorite wives was a Rajput princess, Jagat Ghasain Begum. Jahangir named her Taj Bibi Bilkis Makani and she gave birth to Prince Guram, the future Shah Jahan, Jahangir's successor to the throne. On July 7, 1586 he married a daughter of Raja Rai Singh, Maharaja of Bikanir. In July 1586, he married Mali Kashakar Begum, daughter of Sultan Abu Said Khan Jagatai, Sultan of Kashar. In 1586, he married Sahibai Jamal Begum, daughter of Khwaja Hassan, of Herat, a cousin of Zain Khan Kokadad. In 1587, he married Mali Kajahan Begum, daughter of Bim Singh, Maharaja of Jaisalmer. He also married a daughter of Raja Darya Malbas. In October 1590, he married Zora Begum, daughter of Mirza Sanyar Hazara. In 1591, he married Karam Nazi Begum, daughter of Raja Kesho Das Ritor, of Mersha. On January 11, 1592, he married Kanwal Rani, daughter of Ali Sher Khan, by his wife, Gul Kachan. In October 1592, he married a daughter of Hussain Chak, of Kashmir. 
In January slash March 1593, he married Nua Anisa Begum, daughter of Ibrahim Hussein Mirza, by his wife, Gulruk Begum, daughter of Kamran Mirza. In September 1593, he married a daughter of Ali Khan Faruqi, Raja of Khandesh. He also married a daughter of Abdullah Khan Baluch. On June 28, 1596, he married Kasmahal Begum, daughter of Zain Khan Koka, sometimes Sabadar of Kabul and Lahore. In 1608, he married Saliha Banda Begum, daughter of Kasim Khan, a senior member of the imperial household. On June 17, 1608, he married Koka Kumari Begum, eldest daughter of Jagat Singh, Yuvraj of Amber. Jahangir married the extremely beautiful and intelligent Maran Niza, better known by her subsequent title of Nua Jahan, on May 25, 1611. She was the widow of Sher Afghan. Maran Niza became his indisputable chief consort and favorite wife immediately after their marriage. She was witty, intelligent, and beautiful, which was what attracted Jahangir to her. Before being awarded the title of Nua Jahan, Light of the World, she was called Nua Mahal, Light of the Palace. Her abilities are said to range from fashion designing to hunting. There is also a myth that she had once killed four tigers with six bullets. Maran Nisa, or Nua Jahan, occupies an important place in the history of Jahangir. She was the widow of a rebel officer, Sher Afghan, whose actual name was Alikli Beg Verstailu. He had earned the title Sher Afghan, Tiger Tasser, from Emperor Akbar after throwing off a tiger that had leapt to attack Akbar on the top of an elephant in a royal hunt at Bengal and then stabbing the fallen tiger to death. Akbar was greatly affected by the bravery of the young Turkish bodyguard accompanying him and awarded him the captaincy of the Imperial Guard at Burdwan, Bengal. Sher Afghan had killed in rebellion. After having learned of Jahangir's orders to have him slain to possess his beautiful wife Maran Niza as Jahangir yearned for her much earlier than her wedding to Sher Afghan, the governor of Bengal Kutbuddin Koka who was instructed secretly by Jahangir in his quest and who also was the emperor's foster brother and Sheikh Salim Chishti's grandson and consequently had been slain by the guards of the governor. The widow Maran Niza was brought to Agra along with her nine-year-old daughter and placed in, or refused to be placed in, the royal harem in 1607. Jahangir married her in 1611 and gave her the title of Nua Jahan or Light of the World. It was rumored that Jahangir had a hand in the death of her first husband Sher Afghan, albeit there is no recorded evidence to prove that he was guilty of that crime, in fact most travelers report say that he met her after Sher Afghan's death. See Ellison Banks Findley's scholarly biography for a full discussion. The loss of Kandahar was due to Prince Kurram's refusal to obey her orders. When the Persians besieged Kandahar, Nua Jahan was at the helm of affairs. She ordered Prince Kurram to march for Kandahar, but the latter refused to do so. There is no doubt that the refusal of the prince was due to her behavior towards him, as she was favoring her son in law, Sharyar, at the expense of Kurram. Kurram suspected that in his absence, Sharyar might be given promotion and Thaith might die on the battlefield. This fear forced Kurram to rebel against his father rather than fight against the Persians, and thereby Kandahar was lost to the Persians. Nua Jahan struck coins in her own name during the last years of Jahangir's reign when he was taken ill. Under Jahangir, the empire continued to be a war state attuned to conquest and expansion. Jahangir's most Turksome foe was the Rana of Moor, Amar Singh, who finally surrendered in 1613 to Kurram's forces. In the northeast, the Mughals clashed with the Ahams of Assam whose guerrilla tactics gave the Mughals a hard time. In northern India, Jahangir's forces under Kurram defeated their other principal adversary, the Raja of Kangra, in 1615, in the Deccan, his victories further consolidated the empire. But in 1620, Jahangir fell sick, and so ensued the familiar quest for power. Nua Jahan married her daughter to Sharyar, Jahangir's youngest son from his other queen, in the hope of having a living male heir to the throne when Jahangir died. In the year 1594, Jahangir was dispatched by his father, the Mughal Emperor Akbar, alongside Abul Hassan Asaf Khan, also known as Mirza Jafar Beg son of Mirza Giyaz Beg Isfahani and brother of Nua Jahan, and Abul Fazlib and Mubarak, to defeat the renegade Bir Singh Dio of Bundela and capture the city of Orca, which was considered the center of the revolt. Jahangir arrived with a force of 12,000 after many ferocious encounters and finally subdued the Bundela and ordered Bir Singh Dio to surrender. After tremendous casualties and the start of negotiations between the two, Bir Singh Dio handed over 5,000 Bundela infantry and 1,000 cavalry, but he feared Mughal retaliation and remained a fugitive until his death. The victorious Jahangir, at 26 years of age, 
ordered the completion of the Jahangir Mahal, a famous Mughal citadel in Orca, to commemorate and honor his victory. Jahangir then gathered his forces under the command of Ali Kuli Khan and fought Lakshmi Narayan of Kach Bihar. Lakshmi Narayan then accepted the Mughals as his suzerains. He was given the title Nazir and later established a garrison at Athrakatha. In 1613, the Portuguese seized the Mughal ship Rahimi, which had set out from Surat on its way with a large cargo of 100,000 rupees and pilgrims, who were on their way to Mecca and Medina in order to attend the annual Hajj. The Rahimi was owned by Maria Muzamani, mother of Jahangir and Akbar's Rajput wife. She was referred to as Queen Mother of Hindustan during his reign. Rahimi was the largest Indian ship sailing in the Red Sea and was known to the Europeans saw the Great Pilgrimage Ship. When the Portuguese officially refused to return the ship and the passengers, the outcry of the Mughal court was unusually severe. The outrage was compounded by the fact that the owner and the patron of the ship was none other than the revered mother of the current emperor. Jahangir himself was outraged and ordered the seizure of the Portuguese town Daman. He ordered the apprehension of all Portuguese within the Mughal Empire, have further confiscated churches that belonged to the Jesuits. This episode is considered to be an example of the struggle for wealth that would later ensue and lead to colonization of the Indian subcontinent. Jahangir was responsible for ending a century-long struggle with the state of Mwar. The campaign against the Rajputs was pushed so extensively that they were Medato submit with great loss of life and property. Jahangir posted Islam Khanai to subdue Musa Khan, an Afghan rebel in Bengal, in 1608. Jahangir also thought of capturing Congre Fort, which Akbar had failed to do in 1615. Consequently, a siege was laid and the fort was taken in 1620, which resulted in the submission of the Raja of Champa who was the greatest of all the Rajas in the region. The district of Kistwar, in the state of Kashmir, was also conquered. Jahangir was trying to restore his health by visiting Kashmir and Kabul. He went from Kabul to Kashmir but decided to return to Lahore on account of a severe cold. Jahangir died on the way back from Kashmir near Sarai Sadabad in Pimber in 1627. To preserve his body, the entrails were removed and buried in the Bagsar Fort, Kashmir. The body was then transferred to Lahore to be buried in Shah Darabagh, a suburb of Lahore, Punjab. He was succeeded by his third son, Prince Guram, who took the title of Shah Jahan. Jahangir's elegant mausoleum is located in the Shah Dara locale of Lahore and is a popular tourist attraction. Sir Thomas Rowe was England's first ambassador to the Mughal court. Relations with England turned tense in 1617 when Rowe warned the Jahangir that if the young and charismatic Prince Shah Jahan, newly instated as the Subedar of Gujarat, had turned the English out of the province, then he must expect we would do our justice upon seas. Shah Jahan chose to seal an official firm in allowing the English to trade in Gujarat in the year 1618. Many contemporary chroniclers were not sure quite how to describe Jahangir's personal belief structure. Ro labeled him an atheist, and although most others sheet away from that term, they did not feel as though they could call him an orthodox Sunni. Ro believed Jahangir's religion to be of his own making, for he envies, the prophet, Muhammad and wisely sees no reason why he should not be as great a prophet as he and therefore professed himself so. He hath found many disciples that flatter or follow him. At this time, one of those disciples happened to be the current English ambassador, though his initiation into Jahangir's inner circle was devoid of religious significance for Ro, as he did not understand the full extent of what he was doing, Jahangir hung a picture of himself set in gold hanging at a wire gold chain round Ro's neck. Ro thought it an especial favor. For that all the great men that wear the king's image, which none may dob you to whom it is given, receive no other than a medal of gold as big as sixpence. Had Roe intentionally converted, it would have caused quite a scandal in London. But since there was no intent, there was no resultant problem. Such disciples were an elite group of imperial servants, with one of them being promoted to chief justice. However, it is not clear that any of those who became disciples renounced their previous religion so it is probable to see this as a way in which the emperor strengthened the bond between himself and his nobles. Despite Rose's somewhat casual use of the term atheist, he could not quite put his finger on Jahangir's real beliefs. Ro lamented that the emperor was either the most impossible man in the world to be converted, or the most easy, for he loves to hear, and hath so little religion yet, that he can well abide to have any derided. This should not imply that the multi-confessional state appealed to all or that all Muslims were happy with the situation in India. In a book written on statecraft for Jahangir, the author advised him to direct all his energies to understanding the counsel of the sages and to comprehending the intimations of the ulama. 
At the start of his regime many staunch Sunnis were hopeful, because he seemed less tolerant to other faiths than his father had been. At the time of his accession and the elimination of Abu Fazl, his father's chief minister and architect of his eclectic religious stance, a powerful group of orthodox noblemen had gained increased power in the Mughal court. Jahangir did not always benevolently regard some Hindu customs and rituals. On visiting a Hindu temple, he found a statue of a man with a pig's head, more than likely actually a boar's head, a representation of Varaa, one of the idols in the Hindu religion, so he ordered them to break that hideous form and throw it in the tank. If the Tuzuk is reliable on this subject, and there is no reason to suspect that it is not, then this was an isolated case. J.F. Richards argues that Jahangir seems to have been persistently hostile to popularly venerated religious figures, which is debatable. A Muslim saint, Mujad Alif Sani Imami Rabani Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi al Faruqi, who had gained large number of followers through his spiritual preaching, was imprisoned in Gwalior Fort. Most notorious was the execution of the Sikh Gurwar Yandabji, whom Jahangir had had killed in prison. His lands were confiscated and his sons imprisoned as Jahangir suspected him of helping Kisrao's rebellion. It is unclear whether Jahangir even understood what a Sikh was, referring to Guru Aryan as a Hindu, who had captured many of the simple-hearted of the Hindus and even of the ignorant and foolish followers of Islam, by his ways and manners. For three or four generations, of spiritual successors, they had kept this shop warm. The trigger for Guru Aryan's execution was his support for Jahangir's rebel son Kisrao Mirza, yet it is clear from Jahangir's own memoirs that he disliked Guru Aryan before then, many times it occurred to me to put a stop to this vain affair or bring him into the assembly of the people of Islam. Mukarab Khan sent to Jahangir a European curtain, tapestry, the like of which in beauty no other work of the Frank, European, painters has ever been seen. One of his audience halls was adorned with European screens. Christian themes attracted Jahangir, and even merited a mention in the Tuzuk. One of his slaves gave him a piece of ivory into which had been carved four scenes. In the last scene there is a tree, below which the figure of the revered, Hazrat, Jesus is shown. One person has placed his head at Jesus' feet, and an old man is conversing with Jesus and four others are standing by. Though Jahangir believed it to be the work of the slave who presented it to him, Said Ahmad and Henry Beveridge suggest that it was of European origin and possibly showed the transfiguration. Wherever it came from, and whatever it represented, it was clear that a European style had come to influence Mughal art, otherwise the slave would not have claimed it as his own design, nor would he have been believed by Jahangir. Jahangir was fascinated with art and architecture. Jahangir himself is far from modest in his autobiography when he states his prowess at being able to determine the hardest of any portrait by simply looking at a painting. He also preserved paintings of Emperor Akbar's period. An excellent example of this is the painting of musician Nabat Khan, son-in-law of legendary Tansen. It was the work of Ustad Mansur. As he said, Jahangir took his connoisseurship of art very seriously. Paintings created under his reign were closely catalogued dated and even signed, providing scholars with fairly accurate ideas as to when and in what context many of the pieces were created, in addition to their aesthetic qualities. The Jesuits had brought with them various books, engravings, and paintings and, when they saw the delight Akbar held for them, sent for more and more of the Samato be given to the Mughals, as they felt they were on the verge of conversion, a notion which proved to be very false. Instead, both Akbar and Jahangir studied this artwork very closely and replicated and adapted it, adopting much of the early iconographic features and later the pictorial realism for which Renaissance art was known. Jahangir was notable for his pride in the ability of his court painters. A classic example of this is described in Sir Thomas Rowe's diaries, in which the emperor had his painters copy a European miniature several times creating a total of five miniatures. Jahangir then challenged Rowe to pick out the original from the copies, a feat Sir Thomas Rowe could not do, to the delight of Jahangir. Jahangir was also revolutionary in his adaptation of European styles. A collection at the British Museum in London contains 74 drawings of Indian portraits dating from the time of Jahangir, including a portrait of the emperor himself. These portraits are a unique example of art during Jahangir's reign because before and for some time after, faces were not drawn full head on and including the shoulders as well as the head as these drawings are. Jahangir is widely considered to have been a weak and incapable ruler. Orientalist Henry Beveridge, editor of the Tusk e Jahangiri, compares Jahangir to the Roman Emperor Claudius, for both were weak men. In their wrong places as rulers. 
and had Jahangir been head of a natural history museum, he would have been a better and happier man. Sir William Hawkins who visited Jahangir's court in 1609, said, in such short that what this man's father, called Akbar Padasha, Padshah Akbar, got of the Deccans, this king, Salim Shah, Jahangir, beginneth to lose. Italian writer and traveler, Nicolao Mainixai, who worked under Jahangir's grandson, Darashiko, began his discussion about Jahangir by saying, it is a truth tested by experience that sons dissipate what their fathers gained in the sweat of their brow. According to John F. Richards, Jahangir's frequent withdrawal to a private sphere of life was partly reflective of his indolence, brought on by his addiction to a considerable daily dosage of wine and opium. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.